So those of you who are conservative in your political views will understand if I tell you to turn to the Book of Lamentations. <laughs> But um, I want to clarify that I actually felt the Lord wanted me to speak on this passage when I didn't actually know. Um, and some people would say, we still don't know the outcome of the election. It kind of all depends on what information you're trusting or looking at or who you're following somewhere. Um, but no, actually, I did feel like the Lord wanted me to speak on this. Uh, this passage kept coming to my mind. And, um, and I actually put together the entire outline and did all my studying and then I went outside and when I went outside to um, I was going to go um, get the, that mattress Mrs. Olson was given us and I was getting things ready in the car and then I just pulled out my phone and started looking up some news and that's when I saw that they had that some of the news outlets anyway had called the race and that for Biden and all those things so this was all not really thinking specifically about that um what I was really thinking about was when things don't go the way that you hope or the way that you plan, that can relate to politics. But honestly, as Christians, that happens to us all the time. That happens to us probably every week. And uh, it's certainly not just something that uh, relates to um, just uh, who wins an election and things like that. Um, but uh, I want to talk to you this morning about the subject, dealing with disappointment. Dealing with disappointment. And I'm going to read Lamenta Lamentations chapter 3. And I'm going to start with verse 1. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 1. One interesting thing about Lamentations is uh, if you'll notice in the book of Lamentations, uh, all of the chapters are either 22 verses or 66. Lamentations chapter 3 has 66 verses, and there's a reason for that. Um, there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, and uh, each verse begins with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet, going through chapter 1, and chapter 2, and then chapter 3. There are three verses that begin with one letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and three other verses that begin with the next. And the reason that the ancient Hebrews used to do that, they used to write poetry, uh, very often Psalm 119 is the same way, except that's eight verses that start with each letter. That's why you have Aleph, Bet, Gimel, those sections of Psalm 119. That's why you have, it's eight times 22 is 176. That's why you have 176 um, verses in Psalm 119. Also Psalm 112, and there are some other passages as well that, have, that use that. And they used it as a way of, to help people memorize. You can think that if you were a Hebrew young man after you did your bar mitzvah or whatever and you were learning a psalm or learning a passage of scripture, if you're trying to think of the next, the first word of the next verse, if you knew it was the next word in the alphabet, it would be easier for you to remember, wouldn't it? And so uh, that's why they did that. So, But I just got to point that out to you. It's an interesting thing. Now, Lamentations were written by Jeremiah last week. I, talk, I preached out of Jeremiah and we talked about well, uh, that God says it's unthinkable. And it was about how God said that when they sacrificed their own children, that's something he said, I neither commanded it nor spake it, neither came it into my mind, that God could not even think about this horrible thing they were doing by sacrificing their own children, which we know, of course, is going on in America today, mm -hmm. that mothers are being encouraged to sacrifice their own children on the altar of their own maybe health, uh, c a convenience, so many things. And it's it's tragic. It's very tragic. Maybe there's their, 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 their careers, their plans. And really, it's what they're planning to do for the next nine months. They're literally sacrificing their child's life for the sake of the next nine months because there are millions of couples that would love to adopt that baby. And so that's really what they're asking them to do, sacrifice the child for some other idol, some other god. It's very sad. And Jeremiah encourages me because when I see what Jeremiah went through, Jeremiah had a ministry 40 years. If you add up the time from the time of Josiah's when he started preaching to the time of the carrying away to Babylon, that time period, if you study it out, is 40 years. So Jeremiah was a preacher whom God called to preach for 40 years and no one listened. And everything he predicted came to pass. That's very difficult for me. A lot of what I teach, what I've taught for six years as a pastor, 
I've seen it come to pass people's lives because I said, if you do this, this is going to happen. And they just go out and do it. And some of you that are parents, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You tell your children, if you do this, and sometimes your grown children, if you do this, this will come to pass. And you don't really like being, you would rather be a false prophet, wouldn't you? <laughs> you would rather predict it and it not happen. And it breaks your heart when it happens. Um, but the important thing to understand about that is this. God called Jeremiah to be faithful to his word regardless of the consequences, regardless of the results. And that is so important that we as Christians, we get back to that idea. God wants us to be, uh, you know, Moses said, I would that all the Lord's servants were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. And the Apostle Paul said to the Corinthians, he said, forbid not to speak with tongues. He says, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. And so what is he saying? He's saying your desire needs to be to prophesy. And what does that mean, though? It means that whatever is the message that you get from the word of God that the Holy Spirit lays on your heart to share with someone else, be faithful, no matter the consequences. Be faithful. It's not about the consequences. not about people listen, people obey, but it's about whether or not you are being obedient to the will of God for your life and the call of God on your life. And that's true for every single uh, person here. The Bible says in the last days, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. On my servants, on my handmaidens, shall I pour out in my spirit of my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. And all of that is very simply just referring to um, have living, meditating in the word of God day and night, and then the Holy Spirit brings the scripture and the biblical truth to your mind at the right time, at the right place. It's exactly what a person needs to hear. And we have to be obedient to that, even though someone may not like us when we speak the truth. We have to be obedient to that. And that's what Jeremiah had to do for 40 years. It, it blows my mind if six years is, <laughs> has been a challenge for me. Is I think of 40 years and no one listening. I mean, I have a few people here that actually listen to me. That's amazing. No one listening. You know, Go out in the street and they're like, kill them. You know? <laughs> they tried to kill them several times. You know, None of you have tried to kill me yet. That's amazing. So um, anyway, uh, I really don't even have it, Rob. Why is that? So far, so far, so far. You haven't heard the rest of this message. Huh? So, so dealing with disappointment. And so here's an interesting thing. Jeremiah warned them, if you don't repent, look at what you're doing, ch killing your own children. If you don't repent, you're going to go into captivity. Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. You know what happens? Exactly what he said happened. And the book of Lamentations was what he wrote after all that came to pass. It'll break your heart to read the book of Lamentations, but Jeremiah loved God's people. But do you know in the very middle, the exact middle chapter of the book of Lamentations, Jeremiah switches from talking about Jerusalem to talking about himself. And he starts talking about his disappointment. And he starts to blame God for his disappointment. I actually saw someone put on Facebook um, yesterday or the day before, well, is it, wouldn't it be God's will for this candidate to win? So why didn't he win? And I can just kind of hear in that person's post this question, what's God doing? And you know, we can all get to that point where in our disappointment, we start looking at God and going, God, um, there's all these promises in your word that I believe. There's all these promises that I claim. God... I thought if I did the right thing, you'd reward me. And I thought this person was going to be saved, and they aren't saved yet. I thought this sickness would be healed, and it hasn't been healed yet. I thought this financial problem would be taken care of. I thought this erring child would come back. I thought this church member would start living for God by now, and it's not happening. And God, I'm disappointed. And God, I preached for years. God's word is true. And we can just walk in victory and you can name it and claim it and receive and believe and it's all going to happen. And then like David brought up in prayer time, or then you read Apostle Paul and you go, well, there's a man who had a few disappointing moments in his life. <laughs> just, just a few. And then we go back to the word of God and say, okay, God, what do you want to teach us about dealing with disappointment? What do you want to teach us? Because there's a lesson in that. There's a lesson in disappointment, but we have to be willing to go and learn that lesson. And this is true whether it's uh, an election not going out the way, turning out the way you plan, or at least so far. It's true uh, with your your own life, your own plans, your finances, your 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 dreams, your visions, your hopes, your fears. It doesn't matter. We all have different things. We get disappointed in. You know, my favorite uh, preacher, George, he likes to say, "Well, you're here today, and you say, Brother Joe, I've never been disappointed.'" 
And he says, have you never been disappointed? You've never been married. <laughs> and he says, have you never been disappointed? You've never had teenagers. <laughs> and he says, have you never been disappointed? You've never been the pastor of a Baptist church. And he says, I take that back. If you've never been disappointed, you've never been the pastor of any church. <laughs> so we all have times we get disappointed. Okay, there's times of joy and at times of encouragement and excitement. There's times of victory. There's times of answered prayer. There's times where people get saved. There's times where people get healed. There's times where the miraculous things happen. But then we have times of disappointment. And we need to learn how to deal with disappointment. And so right here, smack dab in the middle of, of Lamentations, there's this chapter, uh, chapter, 60, uh, chapter 66, ver 66 verses, chapter 3, and Jeremiah turns his attention from what happened and all the lamentations about Jerusalem and all the horrible things that happened and people eating their own families and things because of they were, they're starving to death. All the things that horrible things that happened and everything in the temple being burned to the ground and, and all of the, the utensils being taken to Babylon and the, the thing, the beautiful things that Solomon built being cut in pieces and just, and people being slain and just blood in the streets and all of that and, and, and everything being burned with fire and he turns his attention and he says, Jeremiah says, God, I'm really disappointed. <laughs> and he starts talking to God. And he starts talking about God. And he starts talking about how things aren't turning out the way he planned. But you know, this, past, this chapter is so amazing because it is one of the passages in the Bible that has the most hope. It has the deepest despair. And it has the greatest hope. That you, greatest passage, one of the most well-known verses in the Bible is right in the middle of Lamentations chapter 3. And so what we see here is God has a lesson for us on dealing with disappointment. Dealing with disappointment. So, first of all, in verses 1 through 20, I want to talk to you about the first thing we see in this chapter about dealing with disappointment. So I'm going to read that to you. Jer uh, Lamentations chapter 3, verses 1 through 20, I'll read first. I am the man that hath seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. He hath led me and brought me into darkness, but not into light. Surely against me is he turned. He turneth his hand against me all the day. My flesh and my skin hath he made old. He hath broken my bones. He hath builded against me and compassed me with gall and travail. He hath set me in dark places as they that be dead of old. He hath hedged me about that I cannot get out. He hath made my chain heavy. Also when I cry and shout, he shutteth out my prayer. He hath enclosed my ways with hewn stone. He hath made my paths crooked. He was unto me as a bear lying in wait and as a lion in secret places. You understand he's talking about God right now. This is a prophet who has been, who wrote the whole book of Jeremiah, who wrote scripture. He's a prophet who's been faithful for 40 years. And listen to what he's saying about God. He's like, God's my enemy. God's trying to kill me. God's hunting me down. That's how he feels. That's not reality, but that's how he feels. And listen, all of us have times in our lives where we feel exactly like Jeremiah. He hath turned aside my ways and pulled me in pieces. He hath made me desolate. He hath bent his bow and set me as a mark for the arrow. He hath caused the arrows of his quiver to enter into my reins. Would you like to get an arrow right in your kidneys? Not a good feeling. I was a derision to all my people and their song all the day. He hath filled me with bitterness. He hath made me drunken with wormwood. Wormwood is a bitter, bitter thing. He hath also broken my teeth with gravel stones. Anybody feel like eating gravel this morning? He hath covered me with ashes. And thou hast removed my soul far off from peace. I forgot prosperity. And I said, my strength and my hope is perished from the Lord. Remembering mine affliction and my misery, the wormwood and the gall. My soul hath them still in remembrance and is humbled in me. This first section, we talk about dealing with disappointment. We see the problems. The problems that Jeremiah has. The problems that we have very often when we're going through a time of disappointment. In verses 1 through 7, we see darkness. You see how he says, he has set me in dark places, or sick. You see how he says in verse 2, He had led me and brought me into darkness, but not into light. Darkness. What is darkness? God, God is light. In him there's no darkness at all. Jeremiah, why are you saying that God has set you in darkness? And it's because darkness is a place where you can't see. And you know, just like we talked about, about Mount Moriah, 
the place of the seeing of God in Sunday school. There were some things that Abraham couldn't see. He was in darkness when he was walking up that hill to offer his son Isaac. But God can see something. He couldn't see, but God can. So when Jeremiah says, God has set me in darkness, he's just saying, I can't see. I can't see anything. It's dark for me. Listen, we all go through times of darkness where we can't see. That doesn't mean God's not there. You were there when I was weary. You were there when I was strong. You were there when I had burdens that last the whole night long. God is there. God can see, but you can't. And you know when you're dealing with disappointment, listen, these are real problems that we go through. We see Jeremiah's problems, and the first problem he had was he was in darkness. And we feel that. We experience. We go through times where we're confused, and everything is dark. We don't see a way out. We don't see what God is doing. And God put this in the Bible so we would see that there was a man named Jeremiah who had the same struggles that we have. So number one, well, number one, there's problems, but then within those problems, the first problem was darkness. But in the second, there was silence. Not just darkness, but silence. I want you to look and see what he says here in verses 8 through 13. Also, when I cry and shout, he shutteth out my prayer. Silence. You ever prayed and you felt like God was silent? You ever asked God for something and you felt like he didn't answer? Jeremiah went through that. The problems Jeremiah went through, first of all, darkness, second, silence, but then also loneliness. Look at verse 14. I was a derision to all my people and their song all the day. Thou hast, verse 17, thou hast removed my soul far off from peace. I forget prosperity. Verse 18, I said my strength and my hope is perished from the Lord. Do you see how he's got loneliness? You know, the problems that we go through, right? Now we'll, we'll get to their solutions, okay? But the problems, you need to understand that what you're going through is something Jeremiah went through. It's something Jesus went through. It's something many people, Elijah, um, Moses, uh, Paul said we despaired even of life. He talked about himself in 2 Corinthians 1. Listen, we need to understand that the, the darkness where you can't see and you don't understand what's going on with you, the silence where you feel like God is not hearing or answering your prayers, the loneliness where you feel all alone and everybody's laughing at you, making fun of you, you feel alone like no one understands you and you feel like even God doesn't understand you, the loneliness. These are problems that we all go through. These are problems Jeremiah went through. One of the greatest men of God of the Bible of history. He went through these same problems. These are things that God's people go through. And it wasn't because Jeremiah just didn't have the faith to snap out of it. That's not why. He had real problems. He had real struggles. And he couldn't just wave a magic wand and make them go away. Dealing with disappointment, first of all, the problems. What were Jeremiah's problems? What are the problems we go through when we're disappointed? When things aren't going the way we plan, a lot of times there's darkness. We don't see. We don't understand. We don't see the big picture. We don't understand what God is doing. And then there's silence. We pray, and we pray, and we pray, and we don't seem to hear an answer. And then there's loneliness. We feel like no one understands, and we're all alone, and we feel like even God is far away. Loneliness. Those are the problems. So those are the problems, but now I want to show you that he got a perspective. He had problems. But Jeremiah moved from his problems to a perspective. He got a different perspective. And that's the perspective is found in verses 21 through 30. Verses 21 through 23 says this. This I recall to my mind. That's remembering. See, the perspective comes when we start remembering some things, some things we've forgotten. Listen, when you're going through problems and struggles and hardships and when you're dealing with disappointment, we forget things. I forget things all the time. We're all forgetful people. So he says, this I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. So you're going to have to remember some things. Some things that you knew that you had forgotten when you're going through disappointment. And if you're dealing with disappointment, and you have these problems, darkness, silence, loneliness. You've got to get to a point where you get a new perspective. But the way you get that new perspective is you're going to have to go back and remember some things. Some things that God taught you in the past. Some things that you believed in the past that you forgot because of your disappointment. And he said, this I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. 
They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. And you know that's one of the most famous verses in the Bible. Because the Lord's mercies we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. You know what he remembered? This I recall to mind. He remembered. Oh, God is faithful. Even when I'm going through darkness and silence and loneliness, that's all just a test of faith. That's all just temporary. It'll pass. And I remember, and I can have hope now because I remember that God's mercies are new every morning. And it's interesting, he says, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. You see, a lot of times when you're disappointed and you're in darkness and silence and loneliness, you're still not consumed. You're not finished. You're not done. You may feel like you are, but you're really not. You still got a lot of fight left in you. You God still has a purpose for your life. You may not feel like it, but it's still true. You're God's child. He's got a purpose for you. And so it's his mercy that you're not consumed. You're not finished. You're not done. He's got lots more for you. You know, another passage, it's one of the most famous passages in the Bible. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. That was a message that Jeremiah gave to the captives of Babylon. They thought we're consumed. No, it's of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. See, God said, I still got a purpose for you in Babylon. He said, buy houses, build houses, and dwell in them, plant gardens, and eat the fruit of them. Give your daughters to sons, and give your and take wives for your sons, and uh, and and seek the peace of the city where you're captives. God says, I'm not done with you. You're not consumed. See, it's of the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed. We think I'm all done. We're not done. We think we're consumed. We're not consumed. It's God's mercy. We're not consumed. He says, I got to remember some things. Remembering. To get a new perspective, you got to go back and remember some things. He says, they're new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Listen, God is faithful. And he's watching over you. And he's got a plan. But you got to remember that. That's how you're going to deal with disappointment. You're going to get a new perspective, and it's going to start with remembering. You know, when you're a kid and you messed up, maybe really, really bad. Remember one time, uh, oh, I did a lot of dumb things when I was a kid. <laughs> one time I, I, I was, my, my brother and I were always doing construction work for my dad. We built things out of mud. Out in Africa, we build two-story mud hut huts, and, and we build walls out of mud and rocks, and we were just always doing construction work. And I was up on something, and I threw, I don't know what came into me, <laughs> but there was a, a bucket. Uh, I, we had these, uh, like, um, zinc buckets. These, um, yeah, these, like, zinc-plated buckets, probably on buckets that they, they had out in Africa when I was growing up. And I had a square one of those big squares and I was using it for the work I was doing up high and I took that square <laughs> and I just threw it down from the top story into the bucket oh. and then when I got down there I kind of noticed there was a trickle of water coming out the bottom of the bucket because that that square at that point just put a nice gap right at the bottom of my dad's nice zinc bucket <laughs> and so I went and told my dad he just totally lost it and oh I remember he, he, he made some joke well, it wasn't a joke. He was mad, but it was something about, why don't you get that? Um, and my brother laughed his head off when he said it. I'm like, why don't you go? I think I had some, some, some gum. Or, why don't you go get that gum you got yesterday and go plug up that stupid hole in the bucket you put with my square? You threw my square all the way into that, down to that bucket? What did you think was going to happen? You know, dads and sons. But you know what? I never once had a thought like, I'm done now. He's kicking me out, and I'm all done. You know, I'm, now I'm just going to be, I'm just going to kick the bucket. I never had that thought. <laughs> I knew I was his kid. It was going to be okay. Oh, yeah, he was mad at me. Yeah. But he was going to be all right. You know, you're God's child. You might have been like me, and you might have thrown a square into one of God's buckets. He may not be happy with you right now, but you're still his child. So the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. But God's still got a plan for your life. God's not going to hold your mistake over your head. No. God may punish you for your mistake, just like you may punish your kids for theirs, and then you're going to move on. And you know, someday you're going to look back, you're going to be glad God punished you. Just like now, you look back when you're a kid, you're glad your parents spanked you, aren't you? You're glad they disciplined you, because you know you look at other kids who didn't get spanked, you see how they turned out, and you're like, I'm glad my parents spanked me, even at the time you thought you were going to die. 
But now you're like, well, I'm so glad my parents were strict. I'm so glad they disagreed. You know, God's the same way. You mess up, God's got a plan. It may involve pain, but he's got a plan, and it's going to be okay. It's of the Lord's mercies we are not consumed. So, oh, when you have problems, darkness, silence, loneliness, listen, you need a new perspective. And the perspective is remembering, remembering that God's faithfulness is new every morning and you won't be consumed. He's going to take care of you. That's verses 21 through 23. Remembering. That's how you get that new perspective. Remember. Remember that God, his mercies are new every morning and he's faithful. My dad, great was his faithfulness. He wasn't going to get rid of me just because I, he wasn't going to give me up to the village witch doctor just because I made a hole in his bucket. And uh, so we got to remember that. Get, how do we get a new perspective? We have problems, darkness, silence, loneliness. We need a new perspective. How do we get that perspective? First of all, remembering. Remembering that God, his faithfulness is new every morning, and he, we are not consumed. He's not finished with us. But then also, verse 24, speaking. We need to not only be remembering things, but we need to be speaking some things. You know, your words are so powerful. My words are so powerful. Because we have to speak the right words when we're disappointed. If we're not careful, we'll speak all the wrong words. Words of doubt and confusion and anger and despair. And that's not going to get us out of that disappointment. It's just going to dig that hole deeper and deeper. Here's what he says. He talks about something he said, Jeremiah, in verse 24. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. You see, there was something that he said, and that's speaking. So how do you get a different perspective when you have problems? How do you deal with disappointment? You've got to get a new perspective. How do you get a new perspective? You've got to remember that God's mercy is new every morning. But then you have to speak. And what do you have to say? Listen, this is something you need to say when you're disappointed. You need to say, the Lord is my portion. The Lord is my portion. You know a lot of times why we wallow in disappointment for a long time? is because we're saying... You ready? Trump is my portion. America is my portion. Mm -hmm. Our citizenship is in heaven. The Lord is my portion. Did you know nothing that happens to you on this earth can take away the Lord from being your portion? Nothing shall separate us from the love of Christ. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give unto them eternal life, and no man shall pluck them out of my hand. The Lord's your portion. The Lord is your portion. You gotta say that though. You're not only remembering, you gotta remember some things, but now you gotta start speaking some things. And you don't need to speak, you need to speak your real priorities. You need to speak biblical truth. And you know what the biblical truth is? The Lord is your portion. Did you know you can't even say your marriage is your portion? You can't say your children are your portion. You can't say even your church is your portion. You can't say your health is your portion. You can't say your finances are your portion. You can't say your house or your car is your portion. Gregor, you can't even say the Green Bay Packers are your portion. <laughs> you have to say the Lord is my portion, and that will be your way out of this point. Because if he's your portion, you know what that means? He's everything you need. No matter what happens to you, you always have Jesus. There's a saying, you'll never know Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you need. There may be times where God has to disappoint you so that you'll remember that Jesus is all you need. Because then when Jesus is all your God, you'll realize he's all you need. He's all you need. Jeremiah had problems. Darkness, silence, loneliness. He was dealing with disappointment. He got a new perspective. First of all, remembering. He remembered that it's the Lord's mercies that keep him, kept him from being consumed, that God's mercies are new every morning. And then he started speaking, and he started speaking truth. He might not have felt it, but he spoke it. You've got to speak it because your words are powerful. He said, the Lord is my portion, saith my soul. I am saying something. I'm speaking this. I'm not just thinking it. It's not just as passing. No, I have to speak it. I have to really say it with conviction and decide this is true. God is my portion. All I really need is Jesus Christ, and I will always have Jesus Christ for all eternity. Remembering, speaking, and then waiting. Verses 2, that's a hard one, isn't it? But that's the perspective we need, the perspective of waiting. Verses 25 through 30, listen to what it says. Verse 25, the Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both hope, and listen, oh, we struggle with this, don't we, when we're disappointed. And quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. We gotta wait. See, that's why most often that's why we're disappointed. 
Because there's something that we want, something we're focused on, and then we get devastated, we don't get it, and we don't know how to wait. To wait, to see, God, you have a purpose, you have a plan, you have a reason why you allowed me to be disappointed. You have a reason why you allowed the election to go this way. You have a reason why you allowed my finances to go this way. You have a reason why you allowed me to go through this dark valley. But I have to wait to see it. And you've got to get the perspective of waiting. Otherwise, you'll just kind of throw in the towel and throw it all out and just go do something dumb. No, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait. For me, it's usually saying something dumb. That's my problem. <laughs> Remembering. Remember. Oh, you're God's child, and you won't be consumed. Speak. Say, God is my portion. God is all I really need. God is what's important. And that's more than enough to have eternal salvation and sonship in Jesus Christ. That is so wonderful. Nothing on this earth. Nothing that's. No, there's nothing that I'm disappointed in that's even important compared to that. And then waiting. Oh, the Bible says we have to wait. So many verses on waiting. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man. Listen to verse 27. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. Now, this is interesting. Jeremiah wasn't a youth when he wrote this. Jeremiah was an old, discouraged man. But he said it's good for a man to bear the yoke in his youth. Why do you say that? Well, it's because old men love to make young men work, right? Well, I think they do. But that's not really why he said it. Here's what I think. I think Jeremiah was talking about a man bearing the yoke of his youth as an illustration of waiting. You know when you're young, you're impatient, aren't you? You want a girlfriend? Yesterday. You want a million dollar a year job? Yesterday. <laughs> right? You want everything yesterday. A car, a house, everything. You want it all yesterday. But you know what the Bible says? It's good for a man that he bear the yoke of his youth. He sitteth alone and keepeth silence because he hath borne it upon him. He putteth his mouth in the dust. If so be there may be hope, he giveth his cheek to them that smiteth him. He is filled full with reproach. What? Those of you that are a little older, do you remember what you learned in the school of hard knocks? Yeah, you see your sons struggling in their youth, and you think, it's good to bear the yoke in your youth. Yoke in your youth. Why? Because you learned to wait. See, it's an illustration of waiting. You know why? You're a young person, and you're patient, and you give your cheek to the smiter, and you sit in the dust, and you bear the yoke, and you sit alone and keep silent. In other words, if you go through all kinds of disappointments and struggles and hardships in your youth, and you keep on doing right, oh, God has some blessings for you. Amen. Right. Young man, God's got a great Great wife out there somewhere for you, but you got to wait. Young lady, God's got a dashingly handsome young husband. He may be ugly to everybody else, but he'll be handsome to you when the right one comes along. <laughs> and he's out there waiting somewhere, but you got to wait. And you know what? There may be a good paying job out there for you, but you got to wait. You know what? There may even be a high school diploma somewhere for you, but you might have to wait for that. There may be a college degree out there for you, but you got to wait. There may be... Some incredible opportunity, but you have to wait. I dreamed of doing what I'm doing now. Now I wonder why I dreamed of it. <laughs> I dreamed of doing what I'm doing now when I was 11 years old. I didn't start pastoring a church and preaching until I was 35. I had to wait. It's good to wait. It's good to wait. Perspective. we got to change our perspective. Number one, there's problems. Darkness, silence, loneliness. Jeremiah had them. We have them. Number two, we got to different, get a different perspective. And how do we get that perspective? Remembering, speaking, Lord is my portion, and waiting. I'm going to trust the Lord. I'm going to wait. I'm disappointed right now, but I'm going to wait. I know that God is good when we wait. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him. Waiting. Waiting. So important. So when we're dealing with disappointment, number one, we have problems. Number two, we got to get a perspective. But then number three, listen, it's in this passage, there's protection. When we're dealing with disappointment, there's protection. That's found in verses 31 through 39. And first of all, in the protection, I want to show you what he says. Now Jeremiah is talking about God. He's getting a perspective, isn't he? He's getting his focus on himself, his own problems, and then talking about how he's changing his perspective, and now he's focusing on God, and listen, God's protection. Because here's what he says in verse 31. For the Lord will not cast off 
forever. See, he's feeling cast off right now. You know what he, you know what he says? The Lord will not cast off forever. I want you to understand something. In the problems and the disappointment you're going through, it's not forever. It's temporary. And you know, every single person here, whatever problem you're going through, is temporary. It's temporary. The Lord will not cast off forever. For though he caused grief, yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. The Lord will not cast off forever. So that's a key word there. Not forever. Not forever. Listen, there's you have problems, and then you need to get a new perspective. But then you need to realize that you're protected. You have protection from God. He doesn't cast off forever. You're being, even in the midst of your disappointment, in the midst of your tragedy, in the midst of your disaster, God's protecting you. And that protection is, first of all, it's not going to be forever. But then he says this, very interesting, in verses 33 through 36. Listen what he says. For he doth not afflict willingly, nor grieve the children of men, to crush under his feet all the prisoners of the earth, to turn aside the right of a man before the face of the Most High, to subvert a man in his cause, the Lord approveth not. Listen to this. This is amazing. The first principle of protection was not forever, right? It's not forever. So God is protecting you. God's watching over you. You were under his care in the midst of your disappointment. But this, first of all, it's not forever. What you're going through is not forever. But then second of all, he says this not willingly, right? He said not forever. But then he said not willingly. Now think about this. Wait, God, you don't afflict people willingly? To me, it seems like you're very willing to afflict us. <laughs> Remember when you were a kid and your dad said, this hurts me more than it hurts you? <laughs> There's a joke. Um, the, the, the dad is thanking the kid and he says, this hurts me more than it hurts you. And the son's like, well, then keep going then. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you don't enjoy spanking your kids. You don't enjoy discipline because you don't do it willingly. You don't do it like, yeah. You know, we always had a joke with our kids. We'd make jokes about discipline. They'd be like, you seem like you enjoy it. We don't enjoy it. We're just teasing you about it. We don't. Listen, you don't enjoy it. That's what it means when it says he doesn't do it willingly. It means if God could do what he wanted, he wouldn't discipline you. But the reason he disciplines you is because he knows it's for your good. And in fact, you're the one that chose it, right? You're the one that chose the discipline. Right? You tell your child, don't do this, and then, or you'll have this consequence, and then he does it, and he gets the consequence. Did you choose it, or did he? The child chose that consequence. So it says he doesn't afflict willingly. Now listen to this. <clears throat> You're protected. And when God afflicts you, he's not doing it because he wants to hurt you. But he is doing it because it's necessary. But listen, it's a protection for you. Don't think God's out to get you. And don't think, oh, you really messed up, remember? You're not consumed. But remember this, he doesn't do it willingly. God's not out to get you. Ha, 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 I'm going to see. Wait till I throw this curveball tomorrow, angels, and see how he reacts. <laughs> That's not how it works. <laughs> God loves you. You're his child. He is acting in your own best interest, what's best for you. He doesn't do it willingly. He doesn't enjoy bringing negative consequences, but he does it for your good, and it's going to turn out okay. It's going to be okay. If I had time to tell you all the times I've blown it, you would believe me that it's going to turn out okay. Not willingly. Not forever. It's not forever. It's not willingly. He's not doing it intentionally. There's a protection in this. But listen, this is really interesting. Verses, 30, verses 37 and 38. Who is he that saith, and it cometh to pass, when the Lord commandeth it not? Out of the mouth of the Most High proceedeth not evil and good. I want you to know that in the Bible, when it says evil and good, it's not referring to sin and righteousness. If the Bible's talking about sin, it will say sin. If it's talking about righteousness, it will say righteousness. When the Bible says evil and good, it's actually referring to negative consequences and positive consequences. That's what it means by evil and good. So when it says, out of the mouth, God's mouth speaking, of the Most High proceedeth not evil and good, it's saying, don't you think God is in control of both the positive and the negative consequences in our life? He is in control. By the way, he's protected you and he's protected me from many negative consequences we deserve. He's in control. He allows negative consequences, not willingly, but for our own good. But listen, it says this in verse 37, Who is he that saith, and it cometh to pass, when the Lord commanded it not? Listen. Did, um, 
the news networks call the race for Biden? So they said it. Now pay attention to me. If it comes to pass, according to this verse, did God command it? Who is he that saith, and it cometh to pass, when the Lord commanded it not? That's a rhetorical question. Is there anyone who speaks something in this world, and it comes to pass, and God didn't command it? It's a rhetorical question. It's saying no. If someone speaks something and it comes to pass, that means God actually commanded it. It doesn't necessarily mean he wanted it, but it does mean he allowed it. He allowed it. Listen, when you're dealing with disappointment, when I'm dealing with disappointment, we need to understand that what's happening in our life is commanded. It's going to, Listen, that's our protection. Because God's not going to command something that's bad for you. All things work together for good to them about God. God is not going to command something that's bad for you. It's not forever, it's temporary, it's not willingly, he's not intentionally trying to hurt you, and it's commanded, which means it's part of his will and his plan for you. All things work together for good. He has a plan, he has a purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Listen, you have no idea, but the suffering that Jesus went through, you will go through so you can be like Jesus too. You're God's child. Jesus is the firstborn. You're the second, third, fourth, fifth born. Okay, all the way down. Million born. But he wants to make you like your older brother, Jesus Christ. And your older brother had to go through a little bit of suffering. Just a tiny bit. And you're going to, you know, I'm kidding. You went through a lot of suffering. You know, we're going to have to go through some suffering. To be conformed to the image of his son. That's actually our protection. It's not forever. It's not willingly. And it's commanded. It's so important. So, listen, dealing with disappointment. First of all, we all have problems. Darkness, silence, loneliness. Number two, we got to get a perspective. Remembering the things we forgot. Speaking the things we know are true. And waiting for God's timing for everything. But then protection. We need to know that we are protected in the midst of our disappointment. We are protected in the midst of our struggle. Because everything that happens, God commanded it. It doesn't mean we don't have free will. It Just like your children have free will, but yet you actually have authority over them and over their circumstances, and in the midst of their disobedience and their rebellion and their attitudes, you are guiding their character and shaping their character as they grow up in your home. So your children have free will, but you still have ultimate control over the consequences they experience, and God does too. It's not forever, it's temporary. Don't get discouraged. It's not willingly. God's not intentionally trying to hurt you or cause you problems, and it's commanded. It's all under God's control. Who is he that saith, and it cometh to pass, when the Lord commanded it not? Out of the mouth of the Most High proceedeth not evil and good. And by the way, verse 39 is very important for all of us. Look what it says. Wherefore doth a living man complain? <laughs> a man for the punishment of his sins. You know what my problem is? I won't speak for you. I'll just speak for myself. You know what my problem is? I want to sin without consequence. That's my problem. Now, I'm not trying to say that I intentionally plan to sin ahead. I'm just saying that when I do sin, I'm always hoping there won't be consequences. And you know what I do when there's consequences to my own sin? I complain. <laughs> and that's why Jeremiah said, Wherefore doth a living man complain, a man for the punishment of his sins? Should I really be complaining when I do something wrong and then there's consequences? I shouldn't be complaining. That's just part of my life. That's going to happen. And you know what? Your own children, they're going to be punished. You're going to be punished. That's a normal part of life. It doesn't mean that God's cast us off. And it does not mean that we're going to be consumed. But we can't complain. We're protected. What an amazing thing. So in dealing with disappointment, number one, there's problems. Number two, there's pr we have to get a right perspective. Number three, we need to remember that there's protection. It, who is he that commanded? And the Lord... Who is he that say it? That it cometh to pass and the Lord commanded not. Don't think your life is random accidents. God sees everything that's happening to you. And he knows. He's like, okay, whoop, I'm going to stop that from happening. Whoop, I won't let that happen. Ah, uh, this will be just the right thing. I'm going to let him go through this. I'm going to let her go through that. And he's doing it because he loves you. He's doing it because you're his child. He's got a plan. You're protected. You are protected in the midst of your disappointment. Dealing with disappointment. We all have problems. we got to get a perspective. We need to realize that we're protected. And then last of all, 
in this passage is prayer. Listen to this. Listen to verse 40. Let us search and try our ways and turn again to the Lord. Let us lift up our heart with our hands unto God in the heavens. I want you to pay attention. Up till this point, Jeremiah is not talking to God. But he pivots. And this is what happens to you. And this is what happens to me. When we learn how to deal biblically with our disappointment, is we're going to start out complaining about our problems, and then we're going to get the right perspective, then we're going to trust that we're protected, and then we're going to turn it into a prayer. And now we're going to focus on God. And I want to tell you something. When you turn your focus onto God in your disappointment, that will be when your situation changes. Not always that the consequences will disappear, but you will no longer be disappointed. Because when your focus is on God, now you're having the exact relationship and the exact focus that God intended you to have all along, that God intended me to have all along. Prayer. Prayer. Let us search and try our ways and turn again to the Lord. Search, try, turn. You know what happens? We search, we look at what we're doing. We try them. We test them by the word of God. Okay, God, what am I doing right now? Okay, God, what does your word say about what I'm doing? And then turn, search, try, turn. Now I turn to the Lord and say, okay, God, I'm going to stop doing this. And I'm going to turn back to you. Now I'm ready to pray. Let us lift up our heart. That means our heart. your heart is your desires. That means I'm starting now to desire God. Instead of all these things that made me disappointed, I'm going to start focusing on God. Let us lift up our heart with our hands, which is a picture of prayer, unto God in the heavens. Verse 42, we have transgressed and have rebelled. Thou hast not pardoned. Why? Why didn't God? God didn't forgive? Well, they hadn't repented. That was not pardoned. God's not going to overlook. Listen, your kid, your kid does something wrong, and then he smarts off to you. <laughs> That's not the point you're going to be like, it's okay, let it go, son, it'll be fine. I don't know. Now you're going to bring the discipline. All right, now I'm sorry, Dad. Okay, now you stop the discipline, right? That's what he's saying when he says, we have transgressed and have rebelled, thou hast not pardoned. Why? There's not a restoral of relationship until there's repentance. Thou hast covered with anger and persecuted us. Thou hast slain. Thou hast not pitied. He's talking about what happened to Jerusalem because of their sin. Thou hast made us, thou hast covered thyself with a cloud that our prayer should not pass through. If you're a kid and you're disobeying your dad and you haven't repented, you haven't asked forgiveness, and then you ask your dad to go do something fun with you, you think he's going to take you to do something fun? Mm -mm. So you, he won't hear your prayers. Same way with God. It's not that God's rejected you. It's that he's not going to do the thing that makes you feel good and happy until there's a restoral relationship, a restoring of a relationship until there is repentance. Thou hast made us as the offscouring and refuse in the midst of the people. All our enemies have opened their mouths against us. Fear and a snare has come upon us, desolation and destruction. My eye runneth down with rivers of water for the destruction of the daughter of my people. Mine eye trickleth down and ceaseth not without any intermission. Till the Lord look down and behold from heaven. Mine eye affecteth mine heart because of all the daughters of my city. Mine enemies chased me sore like a bird without cause. They have cut off my life in the dungeon and cast a stone upon me. Waters flowed over my head, and I said, then I said, I am cut off. Now do you see that rather than saying, God is the one that's doing all this to me, he goes, um, we kind of put ourselves in this situation. <laughs> you see how his attitude changes? He's like, all these problems, look what God's doing to me. And then perspective, okay, I'm going to trust the Lord. And then protection, God's, God's watching over, and then he starts praying. And in prayer, he sees his own fault. And now he's not blaming God anymore. Now he's not angry at God anymore. Listen, dealing with disappointment. When we get disappointed, we need to trust in God, yes. But we got to stop blaming God for things not turning out the way we planned, especially when most of the time we're the ones that are messing it up. Now, that doesn't mean there's no hope. It doesn't mean that there's no way out. There is. But we have to get to a point where we stop getting disappointed at God. That's important. He's talking now about their sins, not about how God is hunting them down like a bear and killing them. 
he changed his perspective. And he acknowledged the protection. And now he turned it into prayer. So he said, search, try, and turn. But then, he talked about his sin there. He dealt with his sin. He confessed his sin. All right, now look, look at verse 55. I have called upon thy name. That's the word call. Now what is he doing? He searched and he tried and he turned back to God and now he's calling on God. Prayer. He's calling on God. I have called upon thy name, O Lord, out of the low dungeon. Thou hast heard my voice. <gasps> Look at this. All of a sudden, now God is here. Remember before he said, God doesn't hear me. He's blocking me out. I can't hear. Now God's hearing him. You know why? Because he had problems. Then he got a perspective. Then he realized and trusted in the Lord that he was being protected. And now he turned him into a prayer. And now he's praying and trusting in God. And now he's praying and God's hearing his prayers. He said, Thou hast heard my voice. Hide not thine ear at my breathing, at my cry. Thou drewest near in the day that I called upon thee. Thou saidest, Fear not. Do you know in your disappointment, when you go through all this that Jeremiah went through, you have problems, then you get a perspective. Then you recognize that God is protecting you and you can trust his providence and his care for you. And then you turn it into a prayer where now you're trusting him, now you're seeking him, now you're searching and trying your ways and you're turning back to God. Now you're calling upon him, you know what's going to happen? He's going to answer you and you know what his answer is going to be? Fear not. Do you know what God tells you when the election doesn't go your way? Fear not. You know what God tells you when your health is bad? Fear not. You know what God tells you when your finances are bad? Fear not. You know what God tells you when you really, really mess up your life and you think that nobody else has, although we all have many times? Fear not. That's the answer. But the answer comes when we deal with disappointment the right way. We get the perspective. We trust his protection, and now we pray and call on him in a faith way, in a trusting way. And then God answers and says, don't be afraid. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Search, try, and turn. Call, and then finally ask. Listen to what Jeremiah asks after the Lord answers him. See, Jeremiah doesn't give up on prayer. Jeremiah doesn't, and when he's disappointed and he goes through this whole long process we just studied, in the end, he doesn't say, well, now I'm not going to pray anymore because I'm disappointed and I didn't get what I prayed for. Did you listen? When you don't get what you prayed for, that's not a reason to stop praying. God may have a reason why he didn't give it to you. Maybe something to want to teach you. But you know what? There's all kinds of answers to prayer in your future. There are all kinds of miracles and great things God wants to do in your life. Listen, this isn't the last election either. There's another one coming in two years, and there's one coming in four years, and there's one coming two years after that, and eight years. You think this is the end? You think it's over? Do you remember when everybody thought it was all over because Obama was the president? Then we got so excited about Trump, and now we think it's the end of the world because somebody, some people are saying Biden. Said, Folks, it's not over. Don't you think God wants to do things in the future? Don't you think God has a reason why things don't go the way he planned? But don't you think in the future he wants us to call and pray and ask him to do great things? Don't you think if you pray for one person to be saved and that person doesn't get saved, that, that there's someone else out there God wants to be saved and he wants you to pray for them? Don't you think if you pray for one person to be healed and that person doesn't get healed because God has a purpose in the sickness, just like Paul praying three times that God would take away the thorn in the flesh? Do you think that means Paul never prayed again for something else? No. God, he got God's grace in that situation, and he moved on and he prayed for more things. Listen, prayer is something that we get renewed in our strength and our energy for after we've been through disappointment. We don't go, well, I give up on that. No, I tried prayer, and that didn't work for me. I tried Bible reading, and it didn't work for me. I tried pastoring, and that didn't work out. I tried being a missionary. I tried believing. I tried. No, 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 no. You go through disappointment because God has a purpose and he has something he wants to teach you in the disappointment. And when you get to the other side, you will be more excited to pray for great things from God than you ever were before. When we deal with disappointment in a biblical way, it doesn't diminish our faith, it increases our faith. It doesn't increase our discouragement. It strengthens our commitment to the kingdom of God. So look at Jeremiah. He starts praying again. And he's asking for big stuff. Look at what Jeremiah is asking for. Oh, Lord. Look at his boldness. 
O Lord, thou hast pleaded the causes of my soul. Thou hast redeemed my life. He did. God saved Jeremiah's life. Nobody listened to him. Jerusalem was destroyed, but he was still alive. So he knew God had a purpose for him. O Lord, thou hast seen my wrong. Judge thou my cause. Hey, people have mistreated him. He said, God, those people out there who mistreated me, you need to take care of them. Thou hast seen all their vengeance and all their imaginations against me. Thou hast heard their reproach, O Lord, and all their imaginations against me, the lips of those that rose up against me, and their device against me all the day. Behold, they're sitting down and they're rising up. I am their music. Do you think people are going to make up songs after they win an election, making fun of the people who lost? Yeah. you think people make up songs about Christians, making fun of them? Oh, yeah. He said, I am their music. People love to make up songs, making fun of people they don't like. Verse 64, render unto them a recompense, O Lord. God pay them back. According to the works of their hands, listen to this, give them sorrow of heart, thy curse unto them. Whoa, whoa, Jeremiah, you're getting kind of nasty now. Are you tweeting something nasty, Jeremiah? Persecute and destroy them in anger from under the heavens of the Lord. You know what you need to understand every time you see these prayers for God to judge enemies in the Old Testament? Here's what you need to understand. God's enemies in the Old Testament are a picture of the spiritual battle in the New Testament. So prayers against the enemies are what we pray when we ask God to defeat the devil. That's what we're doing. But... There are the enemies of God that we pray for. We pray for their salvation. We're supposed to pray for the salvation of all men. But we do know there comes a point, if they harden their hearts and they don't listen, that there will come judgment upon them. And even in the New Testament times, we believe God judges our enemies. But we first of all pray for their salvation. But we do know in the back of our mind that if they don't soften their hearts and repent, oh yeah, there's coming a judgment. And so it is legitimate to pray for the salvation of people but also pray for God's judgment on people who do not repent. It's legitimate. But primarily, for you and me here today, what you really need to be praying for is that God will defeat the devil in your life. That God will silence the lies of the devil in your mind, in the minds of those you love, and in this church. That's what you're really praying for. And you've already been through that. I've been through that. We go through that when we get disappointed. We get to the end of that disappointment. We start praying. Bold prayer. God defeat the devil. God defeat the devil. You know why? Because God is in control of who wins elections. And God is in control of whether or not we get hear or answer our prayers. And God is in control of the things that happen to us. And so we trust in him for that. But we don't give up praying. Because we know that the Bible says you have not because you ask not. And we are, there are things that God will give us when we pray. There are three categories of things in the Bible. Most confusion comes from only seeing two. One category of things that are in the Bible are things that we do. I would say people who have the label of Arminian, they tend to focus on what I do. Okay. But then there's another category in the Bible, things that only God does. And people who label themselves in theology Calvinists, they tend to focus on what, things that God does. But did you know there's a third category of things in the Bible? And all three are in Lamentations chapter 3. The first part, he said, This I recall to mind, therefore I have hope. That was his own, um, that was his own choice he had to make. That was something he did. But then he trusted God's protection. He's trusting what God was going to do. But then there's a third category. And here's a third category, folks. First category is things that I do. Second category is things that God does. Third category is things that God does when I pray. Don't miss that. Don't go, well, it's just all on me. Or, well, it's just all on God. Or, you need to say, no, there are some things that I need to do. I got a great perspective. Then there's something that God needs to do. That's the protection. He's going to do that. But then the third thing is now I need to pray. Because there are some things that I do. There are some things that God does. And there are some things that God does when I pray. And that's why prayer is such an important part of that process. Dealing with disappointment. We all have problems. we got to get a different perspective in our problems. we got to trust God He's protecting us. And then, when we get on the other side of that, we got to pray. We have to pray. Because God wants to do 
great and mighty things. Jeremiah 33, 3, call unto me, and I will answer thee. Again, Jeremiah. And show thee great and mighty things, which thou knowest not. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I know we all go through disappointment. And I know right now we may be focused on disappointment of the election, but Father, there's just many other things that we go through, and we need to learn that there is something you want to teach us, something that you want to change in us through the disappointment we go through. And I pray, Father, we'll get the right perspective today. We'll understand that you are in control and that we will pray and ask you to work in our lives, even when we don't get a lot of the things that we are looking for. Father, I pray that you would help us with that. If you're here today and you are going through a time of disappointment or you just feel like the Lord has spoken to you through this message and just, just and you feel like it's something you need to respond to, that you are going to respond properly when you go through disappointment, that you are going to get the right perspective and trust in the Lord and understand that the disappointment is part of his plan and you're not going to give up on your faith and on your walk with the Lord when you're disappointed. And you want to make that commitment today. Um, we just, just encourage this preacher this morning by raising your hand. Thank you. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this reminder. And I pray, Father, that we will go out of here today understanding that when we are disappointed, you're still in control and you've got a purpose in all of it, trusting in you and not losing our faith. Father, I pray you would encourage us to go out and do the right thing, accept the struggles we go through, know they're part of your plan, and then persevere and believe that you've got great things for us in the future. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen.